At the start of this year, we announced that the theme for this year is, I am not ashamed. We've been emphasizing that every month of this year. We have a different emphasis, and uh, I thought it might be good, just in an introductory way, to talk about the fact that I am not ashamed to follow Jesus. That's what we talked about in January. You remember those lessons? You remember, remember that emphasis? In February, we talked about, I'm not ashamed to be called a Christian. Then in March, we talked about, I'm not ashamed, or to uh, March, we talked about, I'm not ashamed to be called a Christian. In April, we talked about, I'm not ashamed to wash feet. And uh, I don't know if you still have your basin with you that was given out to remind you of the fact that we ought to wash other folks' feet, but... uh, Having mine has enabled me sometimes to do things I didn't want to do. Sometimes there are situations that develop that, well, I don't have an obligation to do this, and then I reach in my pocket, and there that is, that foot washing reminder of that little basin that Jesus had, and I hope you keep yours with you. I think it's a great, great tool that uh, helps us to remind each other to serve others. And then in May, we talked about I'm not ashamed to, to stand for the truth. And in June, we talked about I'm not ashamed to defend godly marriages. And June was a full uh, month in many respects, and uh, we may come back and reemphasize this aspect of this because we didn't really get to develop the, all of the lessons because of other activities here in June, but I'm not ashamed to defend godly marriages. And then, uh, obviously, that we're talking about this month, I'm not ashamed to talk about Jesus. Just so you'll have a preview and remembrance of the things that you've already had opportunity to know, we've got the rest of the year, August through December. And so we've listed all of those things that that are there for that month. In August, we'll talk about I'm not ashamed to live a holy life. And uh, in September, I'm not ashamed to belong to His church. I'm not ashamed to enjoy worship. I'm not ashamed to rely on God. And I'm not ashamed to ask for forgiveness. You understand, do you not, that we're not playing church? I remember as a child when uh, uh, growing up in the environment I grew up in that we'd play church. Um, my, my, my cousin, slightly younger than I, was one of the best preachers I've ever heard, except she was female and that made it a little bit awkward. But under that shade tree, I remember uh, that Judy and I, my, my cousin was named as Judy, I remember that Judy and I, did, we could really, really preach. We always made Dot, my big sister, to be the sinner. She had to come forward, you know, and then we'd, we'd mock having a baptism. I don't know how many times I baptized my sister. Uh, not as many times I thought she ought to respond, uh, but uh, playing church. And it was, it was a great, great environment. Sometime I'll tell you some other stories that come out of uh, those, those playing church and the impact it had on the neighbors. Uh, they, they were very much aware of the fact that we were out playing church. And then all of a sudden, somebody would say, uh, let's go get some ice cream. And church would end. I'm not sure exactly, but I'm telling you, we're not here to play church. If you're visiting with us, I want you to know there's reality in the hearts of those individuals who assembled in this building. We're not here to play church. We're here this month to talk about, I'm not ashamed to talk about Jesus. Let me ask you, why are we sometimes hesitant to talk to others about Jesus? Before I give you some ideas that that I think would help all of us to think about together, Would you think about yourself? Why are we hesitant to talk about Jesus? We know we ought to do it. We understand the Bible talks about that. And in the latter part of this lesson, we'll talk about some of the things that we might be able to do to talk about Jesus. But why why are we hesitant to talk about Him? What's your reason? If you had to write down the reason, well, here's here's why I'm hesitant about talking about Jesus. Why is that? And then think about others. And if you were making a list of what, why individuals uh, uh, are hesitant to talk about Jesus, what would you put on that? Well, it may be that one of the reasons is something that can best be described as political correctness. 
You know, we've been brainwashed almost as a nation about that has impacted our lives because of the way things are done in Washington, D.C. You look at American history and, and you listen to those debates that were held back in the days of Abraham Lincoln or some of those early uh, uh, fathers of this land. Why, they would go right at each other's throat. They'd call each other ignorant. They would call each other, they would mock each other's physical appearance. They would mock each other's motives for everything that they were doing. And we have arrived at a time where politically correctness will allow us to talk about a lot of things, but one thing you cannot talk about is Jesus. Isn't that true? Ever had that in a family situation? You're trying to talk to somebody, some relatives of yours about the Lord, and they'll say, listen, we, let's just stop this right here. We just, we're just absolutely not going to talk about this. Well, I'm not sure what their motivation is, but I'm sure that whenever individuals say that kind of thing, that they're cutting themselves off from any opportunity of learning something that might be needful in their life. What's your motive for talking to relatives? What, what's your motive whenever they say, well, we cannot talk, we don't want to talk about Jesus. Is it because you want to make yourself look a whole lot better than them? Is, is that your motivation? Is it because you want to show them how much you know it? No, that's ne neither of those. Are your, what's your motivation? Well, your motivation for that has to do with the reality of life and the things that are really important in their life. And yet by their very words, they rob themselves of an opportunity to learn. I've said to Jehovah's Witnesses sometimes of the, the fact that you are in a situation where you have cut yourself off from any possibility if you were wrong. I'm not saying that you're wrong, but if you were wrong, you, you, you have cut yourself off from any possibility of ever finding out you're wrong. You may not be aware of the fact that we know the Jehovah's Witness because of their diligence out in out knocking doors. In fact, if you do not knock doors eight hours in a, in a week for the Jehovah's Witnesses, then you cannot be a witness. But they'll never even be allowed to visit a church service. I, you may not be aware of the fact that their doctrine says you cannot visit another church. That's the doctrine of the Witnesses. Furthermore, if you hand them a booklet and say, I want you to read this, are you aware of the fact that they cannot read that booklet? They're not, they're told by the witnesses, don't you dare read anything anybody else gives to you. And so I've said to witnesses, it's rather odd that you want me to listen to you talk about the Bible. It's rather odd that you want me to read the watchtower that, that, uh, that, you, that you're uh, delivering today. It's rather odd that you would want me to come to Kingdom Hall. But I said, I want you to understand, if you were wrong, God would have no way, apparent way, of showing you that you're wrong. That's tragic, isn't it? We need to teach our children that needs to be the heart of this congregation to so love truth that we're open to un studying and understanding anything that's found inside the Word of God and to follow, the, to, to follow the Bible. But sometimes in our world where you can talk about anything except Jesus and, and religion, that, that people have cut us off and made it impossible to talk to them about it. Our motive, our motive is not wrong and with the purest of heart, we've tried to talk to them about, about their souls and about their lives. And if they were wrong, they're cutting themselves off from an opportunity to find that which is right. Political erectness is, is displayed in the matter of the spirit of compromise. How do you solve problems in Washington? Well, you give me this and I'll give you that. You give me this and I'll give you that. And sometimes in rearing our children, we go down that same road and and sometimes it's detrimental to young people because it, it does not teach them there is that which is right and there is that which is wrong. We need to understand whether Washington understands it or not, there is evil in this world and there is righteousness in this world. 
And the spirit of compromise tries to say, well, we're not always sure what righteousness is, and we're not always sure what wickedness is or what is evil, and we'll just sort of bring them over here and mix them in together so that you'd, you, well, there's just no way you could ever know that which is right and that which is wrong. Spirit of compromise. And sometimes in relationship to, to discussing the Bible, people are hesitant because they, they do not want to have a, have, have a confrontation. There's that spirit of compromise. And then there is that spirit of us not confronting others. And my dictionary would not let me put this word in there, non-confrontationalism. Sounds like a good word to me. It has a meaning to me. Don't you? We're not going to confront anybody about anything. Why do people not talk to others? It's the society in which we live. Now the question is, in spite of that, are you ashamed to speak about Jesus? Why do we not? Why do? Why do we not talk to others about Jesus? Because of a fear sometimes of discussing moral issues. Who would have ever thought 25 years ago that we'd, we'd, we would have trouble talking about what a marriage is? Who would have thought 25 years ago that for an individual to talk about sexual immorality instead of individuals understanding that the reason we want to talk about it is because God talks about it. And you and I need to understand that even Jesus Himself discussed homosexuality. Have you heard Jesus never said anything about homosexuality? Mark chapter 7, Jesus says fornication that comes from within an individual defiles the man. And in the book of Jude, verse 6 and 7, the Bible describes the sin in Sodom as fornication. The sin of going after strange flesh. That's one of the that's included in the definition of fornication. And Jesus says fornication defiles a man. Oh no, you cannot, we just won't talk about this because we don't want, if you're homophobic. There's something wrong with you if you believe that a marriage is for one man and one woman for one lifetime. And so we tend sometimes to draw back. And that may be why we don't talk about Jesus. What about the fear of destroying relationships? I would like to talk to my friend, but I know how they're going to respond, and knowing how they're going to respond, I'm just not, I don't want to endanger our friendship. What did Jesus say about someone who loves his mother or his father or his brother or his sister and then talks about a whole list of other things more than me and he's not worthy of me? We need to understand that those fears that we have we might destroy relationships is not a reason for us to be hesitant about speaking about Jesus. And then what about the fear of not knowing the answer? Is this it? What if I get involved in a study and they answer, they ask me a question I cannot answer? I want you, I want you to listen. Here's an answer that you can give to every question Every time they ask you a question, hopefully you won't have to use it every time, but here's the, here's the answer. I don't know, but I'll find out and come back and we'll talk about this. That's honesty. And you and I need to understand the fact that, that, uh, that we need to have an appreciation of the fact that people love our honesty. I'm not sure about that. Let me study. Let, let, me, let me think about it. I'm glad you're interested in this. Let's talk about this some more. And then go back and let that not be the end of the conversation, but let that be a part of what's happening in life. Why were others not ashamed? There are some people in the Bible that were not ashamed. There were some that wanted to be ashamed. Why were they not ashamed? In spite of all that was happening in their life and all the things that happened in their lives because they were trying to stand for righteousness. Take, for example, Jeremiah. Why was Jeremiah not ashamed? I suggest to you 
that one of the motivating factors in the life of Jeremiah was the fact that he was chosen by God. And how could he ever forget this? Look at Jeremiah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. I have no idea what a Jeremiah was at this, at this point in his life. But here's Jeremiah. And there's a work that needs to be done. And God is trying to motivate Jeremiah in spite of the fact that he is young. And the Lord says, you're young. I've known you for a long, long time. I knew you before you were born. And I had a purpose for you being born. And while the implication might be that Jeremiah was more chosen in this than others, can we not in our own minds come to a realization that before we were born, before the church ever became a reality, before there ever was Judaism, before there ever was Abraham, before there ever was the flood, that it was part of the eternal purpose of God in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 6 through, well, 13, and, and chapter, uh, chapter 3. The, the, almost the totality of that chapter says that before this world began, God knew He had a plan in mind, and that plan involved that the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. You and I need to understand that God has chosen us. And that is, God chose Jeremiah. God has chosen us. There's an interesting thing in, in Jeremiah chapter 20, where Jeremiah went out and he started trying to talk to other people about the Lord, and he got in trouble. He got in trouble, and every place he turned, and so finally he says to God, listen to the boldness, you ever get, ever, ever be afraid, are you ever afraid to talk to God? He says in verse 7, Lord, you induced me. One translation says, you deceived me. You called me to be a prophet. And you gave me this work to, 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 to be done. And you induced me. You caused me to be this kind of an individual. And you deceived me. And then he says, Lord, you deceived me, and I, uh, and I was persuaded by you, but you're stronger than I am, and you have prevailed, and I am in derision daily, and everybody mocks me. And Jeremiah arrived at the place and made this decision, I'm going to shut up. I've had nothing but adversity after adversity after adversity, and every way I turn, everybody I talk to is against me, it didn't, I didn't think it was going to be this way. Lord, you deceived me, Jeremiah said, and I am in daily derision. For when I spoke, I cried out, I shouted violence and plunder because the word of the God was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. I tried and I was mocked and mocked. Then I said, I quit. I will not mention his name anymore. Ever had those situations? You tried to talk to people and nothing good came out of it? In fact, as far as, far as your feelings were concerned, you felt like, well, what's the use? Nobody's interested. And so Jeremiah said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to shut up. I am not going to say anything else for the Lord. I will not speak any more in his name. And then the verse says, But his word was to me in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding back. And so I spoke. Jeremiah, 
here's a burning coal. The old King James says, it was a burning coal in my bosom. The picture there is of a burning coal that gets inside, inside your clothes. What would happen? If a burning coal came inside, in, 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 uh, inside your clothes, what would you do? Jeremiah said, that's what God's Word does for you. And though I've sometimes felt discouraged, Jeremiah could say, and I finally got to the point that says, I quit. He said, I could not quit because the Word was a burning coal, and I had to speak. Do we feel that? I'm not ashamed to speak for Jesus. And then the reality, Jeremiah, if you don't speak, who will? As our nation Heads for hell in a handbasket. I'm not sure exactly what that expression means. Heard it all my life. Our nation is headed for hell in a handbasket. If that's what's happening, and all you've got to do is look at the news. When's terrorism going to be a part of things that happen in Palm Beach County? If I were a terrorist, and I was anti-Semitic in my view of the world. What better county would there be, an unguarded county, than to come to, into a county that's 25% Jewish and bring disaster? And I'm not talking about just killing 50 or so. I'm talking about major disaster. If our nation is headed for hell, our hope does not lie in Washington. It lies in Jesus. And the only hope for this county, even if adversity comes, the only hope in this county is those who have the Lord in their life and the comfort in their lives, that knowing that they're not alone in the midst of whatever happens in their life. What about Ezekiel? Ezekiel, why did, why did you speak for the Lord? He said, here's why. Those early chapters of Ezekiel, he says, God says to him in chapter 2, starting in verse 6, Son of man, do not be afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words. Though briars and thorns are with you, and you dwell among scorpions. You want to make that literal? Imagine being surrounded by briars and thorns, so that every way you turned, your body was being punctured. You try to go to the left, you try to go to the right, you try to go forward, you try to go backwards, every way you turn, there are briars and there are thorns, and then around you and on your feet, perhaps crawling up your body are scorpions. And he says to Ezekiel, that's your situation, but do not be afraid of their words or dismayed by their looks, though they are a rebellious house. Speak my words to them, whether they will hear or whether they will refuse. They're rebellious. But you, O son of man, hear what I say. Don't you be rebellious like this rebellious house. Open your mouth. And what? There's a graphic picture in Ezekiel chapter 2 where the Lord says, Open your mouth and eat. And then the Lord hands Jeremiah a scroll. It's written on the inside and outside. And he says, Eat this. And Jeremiah takes that scroll given to him by God, and he eats that scroll. And with words from God, in his very soul, he begins to speak, because that message is, is from the Lord. By the way, 
The Lord says to Ezekiel in chapter 3, in the latter part of 2 and the early part of 3, I'm going to stick your tongue to the top of your mouth. And you will not be able to utter a word unless that word begins with, Thus says the Lord. Why did Ezekiel preach? Because he had a message from God. And the picture of receiving with meekness the engrafted word, to use the words of Peter, or the words of David, Thy words have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. On the law of the Lord does he meditate day and night. When that attitude is within the heart of those individuals who are his children, they have a message from the Lord. Ezekiel, why do you preach? Because God made me a watchman. A walled city had people inside that city, and there they went on with their daily life all day long. They bought and they sold and they married and gave in marriage, and they married and they were given in marriage, and life was just normal to them. And up on the walls was an individual who looked outside with the responsibility if there's an enemy coming, you be the watchman, you let the city know what's going to happen. I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked man from his wicked ways to save his life, that wicked man will die in his iniquity, but you're responsible for it. Jeremiah went out and he had the Word of God inside of him. And the motivation that was inside of him can be the very motivation inside of us. And that is, here's our nation that has gone pleasure happy. Who's the watchman? Who sees the enemy? And when we see those around us whose values are not what they ought to be, and while they are good people, to use that word in quotation marks, while they are good people, they're lost. And if I don't see anything, the enemy will come, the walls will fall, and the city will be taken. The rest of that passage says, but if you warn them, guess what? You warn them and, and, and they don't listen to you. If you warn them and they, and, and, and they don't listen, or if, if you see the enemy coming and you don't warn them, the city's going to fall. But if you do warn them and they don't listen, the city's going to fall anyway. But you have delivered your souls. Their blood is no longer on your hands. Our responsibility is not to convert Palm Beach County or the world. Our responsibility is to do everything we can to warn the world about what's about to happen. What about the apostles? What motivated them? It's interesting, in Matthew chapter 19, Peter says to the Lord, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. That, by the way, follows the context of that young man, who, rich young man who came to Jesus. And Jesus says, one thing you like, go sell what you have and give to the poor. Immediately after telling that young man that, Peter's mind begins to work. Perhaps the minds of all the apostles begin to work. And so they say, well, then who then can be saved? And that's where the Lord talks about it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom And then Peter, having summed all of this up, still has a problem and said, Lord, we have left everything. And at Golgotha, physically speaking, they lost everything. And they took the body of Jesus off of that cross. Where are the apostles? The Bible says that in Gethsemane, they all forsook him and fled. And while John is there, 
when, it, when Jesus is being crucified, where are the others? It's over. In John chapter 21, Peter says, I go, I'm going fishing. It's over. It's John chapter 20. It's over. We've left all. What, what motivated them? What event changed their life? They changed. What was it that changed their life? Look at the verses that were read earlier in this assembly. Ignorant, uneducated, men who were untrained, and they're standing before the elite of sophistication and education and richness of the Jewish nation, standing before the Sanhedrin. And the world sometimes looks down on those who are not like they are in reference to education or sophistication or in reference to riches. Here are these, here are these fishermen. And, and they're looking at them and they're trying to figure out what's going on and then they, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And, and they said, we've got a problem. This, this man has been raised. You can't deny the miracles. And everybody knows about the miracle. You can't get away from the miracles. Let's get rid of these men. Let's talk about what we're going to do. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, so that this spreads no further, verse 17, let us tell them not to do it. Let us threaten them. No, let us severely threaten them that from now on they do not speak anything at all about the Lord Jesus. They called them in and commanded them, don't speak in the name of Jesus. Peter and John said, everybody's responsible for their own action. Whether you think it's right in your eyes to hearken unto government more than unto you, you make that judgment. Here's the judgment that we have made. We cannot but speak that which we've seen and heard. Are you ashamed to talk about Jesus? We cannot but speak the things that we've seen and heard. What event changed their lives? The answer is the resurrection of Jesus. You understand the importance of the resurrection? Richard, when you taught my Wednesday night class two weeks ago, you talked about obeying Joshua and following him around those walls of the city, and you might have been filled with reluctance about doing this. What on earth is this all about? We're just going to do it because Joshua said we ought to do it. And then all of a sudden the walls fall down. Would you have any trouble following Joshua after that? Great point. What did they see about Jesus that turned them from being timid intimidated by family, intimidated by the nation, intimidated by the ungodliness in the world. What is it that turned their lives around? What event was it? And that answer is they saw the resurrected Jesus. John says, we heard him. We touched him. And we saw him. Do you believe in the resurrection? Thomas, blessed are you because you have seen and you do believe. But blessed are those who having not seen still believe. Do you believe in the resurrection? More blessed than Thomas who had to see it with his own eyes. More blessed than that individual who said, I've got to put my finger into his hand and my hand into his side. More blessed than those who have seen are those who have not seen yet believe. Do you believe in the resurrection? 
If that's the thing that motivated the apostles, then whenever we talk about the resurrection of Jesus and whenever we find ourselves in a situation where there's all this blabbering that's going on about all of the ungodliness and, and, and all of the, the false ideas that's found by, by our society, the Internet, all kinds of junk is to be found there. Babbling that comes, as it were, at least many of the ideas straight out of hell. We live in a land. What's going to make us not stand for that which is right, to talk about Jesus? I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the resurrection. And whether it be right in the sight of those around us to hearken unto them more than to unto God. Let them make that judgment. But we who have seen with our eye of faith, we who are blessed because not having seen with our physical eye, yet we still believe, Peter says, we cannot but speak what we've seen and what we've heard. And so our VBS, we talked about being soldiers in the work of God and in the kingdom of heaven. Put on the whole armor of God. And regardless of what's in the world, we're going to wear our armor. And how wonderful it is when there is that time of receptivity of the truth. Like on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 obeyed the gospel and the next day there were others and others and the numbers multiplied and there were 5,000 men and a, and a great company of the priests became obedient unto the Lord. Yes, we're going to talk about His resurrection, but whenever adversity comes and you tell us you cannot speak in the name of Jesus, we have a commander-in-chief who goes in the forefront of our army and says, speak a word for Jesus. How do you do this? Very briefly, how do we do this? Who cannot say, come and see? Ever know anybody that's bullheaded and pig-headed like Peter always has an opinion? Andrew found a man like Peter and says, Peter, you need to come and see. What about somebody that's religiously prejudiced? Philip finds Nathaniel, says, come and see. What about those people who whenever they heard that woman who had had five husbands living with another could have been so ashamed of her past and she went in and she'd been in the presence of Jesus and she says, come and see. Which of us cannot say to those around us, come and see. Come and see. Can you say, tell me about your salvation story. You want to start a religious discussion? You're with a religious person. Tell me about your salvation story. If you want to start a religious conversation and get them enjoying that religious conversation and rejoicing and setting an atmosphere, tell me about the time that you were saved. And then you do not immediately chop their heads off. The sword of the Spirit's not intended for decapitation. It's intended to take and tenderly change the hearts of others. Could I tell you my salvation story? And then I open up the book to Pentecost, to Samaria, to Cornelius, to all of these characters that are there in the Bible. That's my salvation story. There may be another approach that you could, do, you could use, and that is at the right time to say to another, if you died right now, would you go to heaven? You want to have a sobering conversation? 
I probably not recommend doing this to a total stranger. I heard once of a barber who, when they used to shave individuals with that single, that, that, that razor, you know, the one they had on that leather strop that they would, and he, as he put the knife to the throat of the individual whose name, or whose neck, whose, to the neck of the individual he was about to shave, he said, if you were to die right now, would you go to heaven? <laughs> That's not the environment. But there will be that time in your life when there's an opportunity and that you can say soberly to an individual, something's happening in their life, something's happening in your life. If you died right now, would you go to heaven? What a conversation starter. What about this one? Can I tell you about a great church I know about? Who is there that doesn't love Palm Beach Lakes? Why would you not say, can I tell you about a church? There's so much going on in this world. Can I tell you about Palm Beach Lakes? Not because Palm Beach Lakes is great, but because we're trying to let Christ be honored here. Come and see. Let me tell you about this church. And then there's that non-confrontational, confrontational way of talking to an individual. One of our young adults on Wednesday night, I'd heard about this Pokemon Go. And so I came to one of our young adults and I said, tell me about this. He immediately picked up his phone and he showed it to me. I'd heard a little bit about it. And do you believe there were three or four Pokemons out here in the back of this building right there? And he said, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there are not kids from these apartments out of here chasing the, the, you know, the Pokemon figures out here around our property. And then he said, could you recommend something to me that I could just give to people so that he, as we're talking about any of these secular things, and he was, the context was if I ran across one of these young people out there, is there something you could give to me? And I took him to that display that's out there. What to expect when you see, when you visit a church of Christ? We're already printing a lot of the material that we're using here. We need to get rid of everything that's out there, but there's all kind of literature that's out there. But here's an individual that you're talking to and you want to say, can I tell you about the church? Another of our members this week, sitting in a waiting area at a doctor's office. And in the conversation with the, that covered a lot of topics that talked about computers and talked about politics and talked about his hobby of flying these jet or these uh, remote airplanes and what you do if you lose your remote airplane and how do you find it when it crashes and do you have your name on it? And to end the conversation, the Christian member of this church sitting in that say that said, "You got you, you're you're so nice. You got to be some, somebody that goes to church." He said, "We don't go at all. We watch it on television." And the member of this church says, "Can I give you something?" And gave them that little track. What to expect when you visit when you visit a church of Christ and said, it's different from anything you've ever seen. Come and see. Non-confrontational, confrontational. What's your way? Whatever fits you. We used to pray on Wednesday night, way back yonder when we had 40 and 50 baptisms at a, at, you know, a year, way back in some of the more glorious days, fruitful days of the church, and we'd have Wednesday night prayer meeting in which we would pray to God, God help us find somebody to teach. Would you pray to God and say, God, I'm afraid to talk to others about you Put me in a situation where I've got to talk to others about you. 
I'll try. Use me, God, in whatever way you can. We have a man that's a deacon in this church who's a deacon because somebody in that Wednesday night service prayed this prayer, God, I'm scared to death. Paint me into a corner so I have to talk about Jesus. And within two months of that individual, a member of this church who's no longer here, within two months of him praying that prayer in that Wednesday night assembly, he baptized his neighbor. Because things happen in the neighbor's life that forced him to say a word for Jesus. You believe in prayer? Let God use you. God has a plan of your salvation. Let me tell you about His plan. His plan involves believing in Jesus. John chapter 6, or John chapter 3, verse 16. It involves changing your life, repentance, because the Bible shows in that that God, it is the will of God that all men come to repentance. You need to confess your faith in Jesus and to be baptized into His very death so that as He was raised from the dead, you can be raised as a new creature walking in newness of life, added to His family, and then serve Him faithfully until you die. Let's not be ashamed to talk about Jesus. How can we help you go to heaven? Won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now as together we stand and sing.